According to uh, Kenneth McKenna in his article, Jonathan Edwards uh, on slavery and the slave trade, the letter he discusses is one of the few, if not the only, uh, writings from Edwards on the subject of slavery. Well, it's actually the draft of a letter. Um, it's uh, written in response to a verbal attack on a slave owning minister, uh, whom McKenna speculates is probably Ed, uh, Edwards himself, um, although we can't be sure. Can't, uh, we don't even know uh, who the intended re recipient of this letter is or who the uh, church member was because there's no name on the letter and there's not even a date, um, although it was probably written sometime around 1738-1742. Um, but the, uh, the purpose of the letter is to defend the institution of slavery um, because Edwards didn't have a problem with slavery. I mean, he owned slaves himself. Um, he, so he didn't have a problem with the institution as long as slaves were treated humanely and were encouraged to convert by their masters or their owners. Um, um, he, however, did not condone the slave trade. Uh, he saw um, it as prohibiting the spread of the gospel. Um, in McKemma's words um, on his uh, one describing Edward's view, continuing excursions into Africa or anywhere else for slaves created resentment against Christian Europeans that could ultimately thwart evangelization rather than providing an opportunity to Christianize. Um, so he, he condoned slavery, but not the slave trade. Um, so throughout this letter, as I said, he was defending it. Um, he used the scripture as well as reason to defend his position. Um, he said that even if someone didn't own slaves themselves, they probably benefited um, in some way from slave labor. So he saw the accusation um, against this, this minister as hypocritical. Um, but he also uses scripture to defend his position. Uh, both the Old and New Testament he uses examples of the Israelites being permitted to own slaves and um, of Paul um, accepting slavery um, and not having a problem with it. I mean, he even uh, tells the slaves to obey their masters and he sends a runaway slave back to his Christian master. So Edwards used examples like this to defend his position. Um, his acceptance of slavery also stems from his, um, his millennial vision. Um, which Mary Locke discusses in her book, uh, Anti-Slavery in America. He believed that slaves who had been converted to Christianity um, while, um, while enslaved would later be responsible for spreading the gospel across the world like during the millennium, um, which is another reason he didn't have a problem with it. Um, so as I was reading this letter, um, it kind of makes me wonder if this incident with the church member um, and the minister was um, was an isolated incident, or if anti-slavery, the anti-slavery sentiment, was more widespread during this uh, during this point in New England. Um, I usually don't think of many people questioning the institution of slavery at this point. Usually, um, think of it as a being later, you know, American Revolution, sometime after that. Um, but I wondered through this if um, if like the anti-slavery thought um, was present in um, in McKemma's works on this period and another scholar, Bernard Rosenthal's article on Puritan Conscious and New England Slavery, it seems that there was a great enough shift in the opinion at this time that the clergy had to tread uh, a lot more carefully in their sermons um, when slavery, the, like the subject, was brought up. Um, Edward's congregation was already divided, um, not just about this issue, but Rosenthal points out that Edward's cautious stance uh, may have influenced the abolitionist leanings uh, of some under his teaching. I mean, his son was an advocate of abolition later in his life. Um, so perhaps um, from reading this article and um, from McKemma uh, and Rosenthal and Locke and a few others, um, it's perhaps this is when the tr transition um, kind of begins to occur from basically the unquestioning viewpoint um, of slavery where people don't question the whole institution, they just accept it, um, to rejecting certain aspects of it and then eventually to the more prominent abolitionist thought.